Hello, my old septic tank. Let me tell you a tale. This morning I woke up, went to the lab, sorted out the barnet, had a go at the boat race, even had a go on the Hampsteads. Went downstairs to have a butcher's from my wallet. Would you Adam and Eve it? I was skint. So I jumped in the jam jar to find me old China ready. He says he's going to lend me a score, only if I pay him back the pony. But let's be honest, it's only a deep sea diver, isn't it? Hello and welcome back and today we are looking at two super 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 budget Synology NAT solutions. Now these are both solutions I have talked about on the channel before. Let's be realistic about this. I have talked about these quite a few times. This here on my left, hopefully you're right, I'm not sure how it works out there at the edit. This is the DS120J. It is by far the most affordable modern generation Synology they have released for quite a while. It knocks around for about $99, and yes, I'm saying dollars, get over it. It, um, the, it knocks around for about 100 notes, and to be frank, it actually gives you quite a lot. Recently, we did DSM-7 testing on this, and weirdly, despite its rather modest stature, and of course, you have to set the device up and it will take a little while, this was able to use DSM-7. And a number of you who are moving away from cloud services, you know, your Dropbox, your Google Drive, etc., etc., are looking at suitable systems like this to knock around for about 100, and then you stick one hard drive inside, and you're like, cool, a localized copy of cloud, you can do some cloud sync and that sort of thing. It is actually quite appealing, and the hardware inside, although it's not exactly awe-inspiring, and alive, I hate those seagulls. It's still a pretty good solution for the price and works as a very, very good entry point for a number of people that have got a bit of patience and a bit of time to get something done in the background. Now, the next rung up in the ladder from this, I would say, is this solution. This is the DS220J. It is a two bay, and although they're both part of the affordable J series from Synology. I will add that both of these solutions are actually quite distinct in their architecture. And this device arriving for about $160 to $170 actually brings things that at that small little price difference are just simply, you know, it, it, it's awful that you can't use them in this. And that's not Synology, you know, clipping its wings. It is just generally, it doesn't have the architecture possible in both a one bay and more modest form to do it. In today's video, although we are predominantly looking at the hardware and of course talking about the software a bit, today I want to help you decide, one, which one of these two you should go for, two, whether you should ignore these entirely and look at some of the more interesting kit, like some of the stuff over there. And three, whether Synology is the brand for you at all. Because let's face it, these aren't the only two NASs in the world. There's quite a lot out there, and I've probably talked about them here on the channel more than any other. So in today's video, when I talk about their similarities and their differences, I'll also try to highlight the brand themselves throughout. I mean, let's be honest, there are two ways to look at a comparison like this. I mean, on the first instance, we can simply look at price. That costs more than that. Good night. And anyone that thinks like that, you probably shouldn't buy a NAS in the first place because the price difference between them of 60 to 70 quid, the difference between them in terms of value, whether that is long-term value of what you get on a return on your investment, or just generally the architecture you're paying for, that is very small like small drinks that's tiny between these two it's absolutely small beer like when you look at this device here it may seem like you know the 50 60 even 70 quid difference between them is going to get even vaster once you introduce a two bay over a one bay but once you have to make provisions um, for fail safes like raid and other ways in which you're going to have to bolster your data storage strategy that number gets even smaller as a distinction between them so Let's look at the most obvious difference between these two devices. Let's look at the main big thing that everyone focuses on straight away, and that's the CPU inside them, because both of them use rather modest CPUs. Till recently, I was under the assumption this was a 32-bit processor. I was corrected in the comments. Thanks again for that. This is a Marvel-based CPU. It's the 88F3720. It is a dual-core 64-bit ARM processor, so that's an, an ARM V8 processor indeed, and that is dual core at 800 megahertz, which by the way, 800 megahertz was fairly weak, even five, six, seven years ago. And I'm really amazed they're still running that processor inside this. It also arrives with a non-upgradable DDR3L memory, and that's 512 megabytes. Now, 
a number of you may be aware that this solution was released, well, I think even less than a year in some regions after its predecessor, the DS119J, that arrived with a simple 256 megabytes of memory. And I think even Synology themselves must have realized that that was just not enough memory to run both DSM and the system. So this device and its half a gig of memory may seem fantastically modest, but it still is able to run DSM-7 once you've got all your indexing and your routine set up, which takes time. Now, the DS220J, on the other hand, that arrives with a quad-core um, IRM 64-bit processor. Now, that is the Realtek RTD1296, a processor that continues to be featured across multiple devices from multiple brands. We've even seen it most recently arriving in the Acer Store series of devices, the Drive Store series have been utilizing that CPU. And it has been the first time we saw that processor, in fact, was back at the end of 2017 when it first arrived on Synology products, way back in the, um, I believe, the DS418J series, and the rest of those Js and standards went on to utilize that processor. The system also arrives with half a gig of memory, but DDR4 um, did, um, memory. So again, Still a rather modest amount of memory, but slightly faster in frequency. Now, I say slightly faster. It is soldered to the board. It's non-upgradable. And this is DDR3L. So, again, slightly um, higher there at 1,866 megahertz, I believe. But still, nonetheless, even though they've got the same memory, it's slightly more preferable memory and a quad-core at 1.4 gigahertz, 4K transcoding enabled CPU as well, results in that this system is able to do just a little bit more per core, but just has more resources in terms of core processor power, less in the memory department, to get things done. Later on, you will see that that is translated quite well into the DSM side of things, because if you do look at those DSM-7 videos we did recently, you'll know that this did a much better job of running simultaneous instances of photos, video, audio, and surveillance running all simultaneously on this system than this could. This did some of that stuff, but it really did struggle after two processes running simultaneously there. Now... In terms of power consumption, unsurprisingly, the um, more cord, higher frequency CPU with DDR4 memory and two bays of storage utilizes more power. The core PSUs, which of course only represent the potential maximum power utilization available to be drawn and not typical utilization, are with 36 watt external PSU and 60 watt. Um, PSU there and again because of the two SATA bays in there and just a few little bits and bobs inside the result is that this will draw more power and make a little bit more noise as well when in operation now it's worth mentioning when we're utilizing these two systems that in terms of connectivity things do differ a little bit as well if we look on the rear of the 120 and we look at the rear of the 220J we see that although they look relatively similar in what they've got inside if we bring those closer to camera you'll see one major difference between them they've both got LAN ports there but this one has USB 3.2 Gen 1 and this has USB 2 now whether that is a CPU lane limitation whether that's in you know something intentional they've done to mark a difference in the portfolio I can't comment but what I will say is a one bay NAS device due to its lack of support of redundant array of independent disks, otherwise known as RAID or RAID 1, as you would find on this, or an SHR. The result is that if all of your data is inside this and you're backing up for your phones and your laptops and whatever, chances are, as you're backing up onto it, that you're going to need another copy elsewhere as you delete files off your phones, delete files off your laptop, and ultimately just not have all your data in one location. So unless you're going to synchronize with cloud services, which means you're going to have largely an active sync at all times while systems are backing up to this with the likes of Drive or taking advantage of some of the desktop clients or mobile clients, or you're going to be using a USB external drive to run um, periodic backups. That is tremendous limitation there on those USB 2 ports there. And it's just a real shame that you're going to be throttled quite significantly with external local connectivity and that the hardware architecture inside, although proficient in single tasks, 
if you're going to be running long-term backups, that's going to be another process. It's going to interrupt everything from other backups to surveillance to multimedia and DLNA media server access. So do bear that in mind. Now, this system here, because it has that RAID internally, you've got that failover support. RAID is not a backup. It has to be highlighted a million times, I would say time and time again. But it doesn't mean RAID doesn't have its uses as a safety net. It lives within your data um, security strategies. And it's very important that you realize that this system, when it is utilized properly, can constitute a fantastic uh, multi-tiered backup solution in a way that this never can. Now, if we move back towards these devices, you may have also noticed they aren't supporting hot swaps. Neither one of them have trays inside. We've got drives inside. Neither one of them uh, support um, that kind of hot swapping dynamic we just mentioned. But also, things like SSD caching, there's no dedicated bays here. The performance you're going to get isn't just that limitation of an external 1GBE port, single port on both of them. But on top of that, it's how that hardware inside can be used both within individual applications and how it can be utilized typically day to day on your uh, distant client devices. So case in point, between these two devices, you can only create one volume on the DS120J. Whereas on the 220J, not only have you got that RAID support there for that storage pool that you create, but you can create multiple volumes within it, 64 volumes total apparently. Within that as well, the maximum usage you can create that can interact with these two devices, you can get over a thousand active user accounts on this, but this device you can only go as high as 512. So although both of these are very lofty numbers for two very affordable devices, those are just the starting indicator of how things have to be trimmed down a little bit by Synology there. Now, we could talk about the applications that are available on here. They both arrive with support of Drive internally. They both arrive with support surveillance station. They both arrive with support of video station and audio station. But it has to be said that you do not have support of a number of the collaboration suite applications on the 120. Things like chat are not there. Office isn't there. It has hyper backup, I'm pleased to say. But a lot of the backup applications, when you're running them, are going to use the majority of the resources available to you, particularly if you're running scheduled ones that may be conflicted. The 220 has access to the bulk of the collaboration suite, although not all of the stuff. And once you go into photo, something that Synology you know, really pioneered a number of their desktop solutions to really push their way into people's offices and homes, both of them arrived in DSM-7 with support of Synology Photos, but... There isn't mo most of the recognition. There's a little bit of facial recognition options in there, but really, really limited. And that was when we're talking about moments and photos, how that translates into photos at the full release, uh, Synology Photos in DSM-7. I think you're going to see quite weak results there. Whereas in the 220J, 220J has the facial recognition, has thing recognition. It has those settings built in for Synology Photos and moments which means you're going to be able to take advantage and use that tagging intelligent search system moving forward and remember that price difference wasn't actually that large to start with if you're going to take advantage of surveillance station on both of these boxes i will highlight that although both of them so arrive with support of synology surveillance station 8.2 platform and both of them will arrive with the ability to see live feed uh, recordings within your web browser and the client apps Synology volunteer that this device should only be used for up to five cameras with two licenses included of course and this for up to 12. What I would say is if you're using this for things alongside surveillance so you're going to run one backup into multimedia or god forbid Plex Media Server and surveillance I would say that if you use more than about two or three cameras on this system along with other services it's not it's not going to happen notwithstanding that memory limitation that's inside at 512 meg, just generally that processor is not going to be able to spread itself that thin and support the system background operations and therefore bringing everything to a standstill. Whereas in the 220J, although it has the same amount of memory, that CPU is able to do more. And I would say it could comfortably support five to 10 cameras if you're not using it for other stuff, but try not to exceed five or six if you're gonna utilize this along with other services. When we did our DSM-7 testing, as mentioned, this was able to run simultaneous tasks of multiple kinds 
a great deal better off the bat than this. And although both of them supported DSM-7, I think this did a much better job of it. This did very well, as you heard me say in my video, for what you've got there, but it still could be a note, diff uh, note better. And with both of them arriving with two years of manufacturer's warranty, they both very much fall into the value structure from Synology. So I guess where I'm going with this video is if you're looking at both of these two, do not hesitate. Go straight to the 220J. The 120J is a great, it's a good low level NAS. If you're only running one task, like streaming uh, media to your console and a couple of devices in your home, great. If you're only running a couple of cameras, one at the front, one at the back, it's a great little NAS. And if you're using it as another tier of your backup strategy or another tier of a synchronized backup, bear in mind there's no RAID. Make sure you bear that in mind so you don't have the redundancy. It's viable for that, but in every other regard, go for the 220J, which leads to that other point before we end the video, is the 220J a good NAS on its own? And hmm, I'm less convinced. If you're looking at a J, you're doing it because you are on a budget. And I think if you can stretch it by lowering the capacity on the drives, changing something else in your setup, making economies, and it allows you to afford the likes of the 220, go for the 220 plus. And I will be doing a comparison between the 220J and the 220 plus shortly, but I will say that the 220 plus is just the, the best entry point into Synology NAS. Although I call this an entry level NAS, the best entry point into NAS is always going to be the 220 plus and pretty much all of the 218, 216 plus, etc. that came before it. It's generally finding a very good line with an Intel processor upgradable memory, and its latest iteration is probably the best that we've seen thus far. But ultimately, if you are looking to enjoy your Synology experience to its maximum and take advantage of the full spectrum of applications, these two might not be for you. But if you only want to use one or two tasks, you're not gonna be overly reliant on Synology's own platform, and you are just looking to move away from the existing Google Drive, Dropbox, and more services you had there via the web browser, and you're just looking for the equivalent of that and not taking advantage of all the applications and the services, either one of these will do a very good job. I just think stretch for the extra and go for the two bay there. It will run with a single drive inside it, and you can add another drive at a later date. Wouldn't recommend it, but it is an option. Thank you so much for watching. If you've enjoyed the video, click like. If you want to learn more, click subscribe and do take advantage of the free advice section over on NAS Compares. It is genuinely free. It's manned by, it's manned by two people, myself and Eddie the web guy. We will help you. Just It might take us an extra day or two to answer. We get a lot of traffic through there messaging us and we do try to answer every single one. Completely unbiased, completely free advice. Take advantage of it. It's a link in the description. I'll see you next time.